the nose by Akuragawa Ryunsuke. In the town of Ikino, there was no one who had not heard of Zenshi Naigao's nose. Dangling from his upper lip to below his chin, five or six inches long, it was of the same thickness from end to end. For 50 years, he had been tormented at heart by the presence of his nose, from his young days as an acolyte until the time he rose to the respected office of palace chaplain. To others, he tried to appear unconcerned about his nose, not so much because his preoccupation with such matters was not worthy of a man whose duty it was to devote himself ardently to prayer for the advent of paradise as because he wished to keep the knowledge of others that he was worried over his nose. With him, his apparent concern was rather a matter of pride, and his greatest dread in everyday conversation was to hear the word nose. His nose was, of course, an intolerable nuisance. In the first place, he could not take his meals by himself. If he tried, the tip of his nose would reach down into the boiled rice of his bowl. So at meals, he had to have one of his disciples sit opposite him and hold up the end of his nose with an oblong piece of wood about two feet long and an inch wide. This manner of taking meals was, of course, no easy matter for the priest whose nose was held up for his disciple or for his disciple who held it up. Once a page who was acting in the place of the disciple happened to sneeze and drop the nose into the bowl. This incident was talked about as far as Kyoto. He could accept the practical inconvenience of having a long nose, but the loss of his dignity on account of it was intolerable. The Ikino townspeople used to say that it was fortunate for the priest that he was not a layman, for surely no woman would care to be the wife of a man who had such a nose. Some went so far as to say that were it not for his nose, he might not have taken holy orders. He did not consider that his priesthood had been a refuge which offered him any service in lightening the burden of his nose, Moreover, his pride was too delicately strong for him to be influenced in the least by such worldly eventuality as matrimony. His sole concern was to resort to every possible means to heal the wounds his pride had suffered and to repair the losses dignity had sustained. He exhausted all possible means to make his nose appear shorter than it really was. When there was no one about, he would examine his nose in the mirror and look at it from various angles, taking, taxing his ingenuity to the utmost. Just changing the reflections of his face in the mirror was not enough. Prodding his cheeks or putting his finger on the tip of his chin, he would patiently study his face in the mirror, but not once could he satisfy himself that his nose was shorter. Indeed, it had often happened that the more he studied his nose, the longer it seemed to be. On such occasions, he would put his mirror back into the box, sighing heavily and sadly going back to his lectern, would continue chanting the Sutra to Kawaran, or the Goddess of Mercy. He paid close attention to other people's noses. The temple of Ikino, frequented by a large number of visitors, both priests and laymen, held Buddhist masses, receptions for visiting priests, and sermons for parishioners. The precincts of the temple were lined with closely built cells, with a bathhouse which had heated water daily. He would closely scrutinize the visitors, patiently waiting, patiently trying, to find at least one person who might possibly have a nose like his own, in order that he might ease his troubled mind. He took no notice of the rich silken attire, the ordinary hempen clothes, the priest's saffron hood, nor their dark sacerdota robes, all of which counted for next to nothing in his eyes. That which arrested his eyes was not the people or their attire, but their noses. He could find hooked noses, but none like his own. Each additional failure made his thinking darker and gloomier. While talking with others unconsciously, he would take between his fingertips of his dangling nose. Then he would blush with shame for an act ill-fitting his years and office. 
His misfortune had driven him to such extremes. In his desperate attempt to find some consolation by discovering someone with a nose like his own, he delved into the voluminous Buddhist scriptures, but in all the scriptures, there was not one reference to a long nose. How comforting it would have been, for instance, that either Mulin or Shailene had a long nose. He did find that King Louis Hussanti of the kingdom of Chu Huan in the 3rd century AD had long ears and thought how reassuring it would have been if it had happened that the king's nose instead of his ears had been long. It needed hardly be said that while taking assiduous pains to seek spiritual consolation, he did try most earnestly a variety of elaborate practical measures to shorten his nose. At one time, he took a concoction with a snake gourd base. At another, he bathed his nose in the urine of mice. Yet, with all his persistent and unremitting efforts, he still had five to six inches of nose dangling down over his lips. One autumn day, a disciple went on a trip to Kyoto, partly on his master's business and before his returning to the Ikinoao, his physician acquaintance happened to introduce him to the mysteries of a shortening nose. The physician, who had come from Japan, who had come to Japan from China, was at that time a priest attached to the Choraku Temple. Zenchi, with an assumed nonchalance, avoided calling for an immediate test of the remedy, and could only drop casual hints about his regret that he must cause his disciple so much bother at meals, although he eagerly waited in his heart for his disciple to persuade him to try the remedy. The disciple could not fail to see through his master's design, but his master's innermost feelings, which led him to work out such an elaborate scheme, aroused his disciple's sympathy, as Enchi had expected. His disciple advised him to try this method with such extraordinary urgency that, according to his premeditated plan, he finally yielded to his earnest counsel. The formula was a simple one. First, boil the nose in hot water, and then to let another trample on it and torment it. At the temple bathhouse, water was kept at the boil daily, so his disciple brought in an iron ladle. Water so hot that no one could have put a finger in it. It was feared that Zenshi's face might be scalded by steam, so they bored a hole in a wooden tray and used the tray as a lid to cover the pot so that his nose could be immersed in the boiling water. As for his nose, no matter how long it soaked in the scalding water, it was immune from ill effect. Your reverence, the disciple said after a while, Suppose it must be sufficiently boiled by now. The chaplain, with a wry smile, was thinking that no one who overheard this remark could suspect that it concerned a remedy for shortening his nose. Heated by water and steam, his nose itched as if bitten by mosquitoes. When the nose was withdrawn from the hole in the lid, the disciple set about trampling on that steaming object, exerting all his strength and pounding it with both his feet. Zenchi, lying on his side and stretching his nose on the floorboards, watched his disciple's legs move up and down. Does it hurt your reverence? His disciple asked from time to time, looking down sympathetically on the priest's bald head. The physician told me to trample hard on it. Does it hurt? Zenchi tried to shake his head by way of indicating that he was not feeling any pain, but as his nose was being trampled on, he could, do not, he could not do this so rolling his eyes upwards, in a tone that suggested he was offended, and with his fixed gaze on his disciples' chapped feet, he said, no, it doesn't hurt. Although his itching nose was being trampled on, it was comfortable rather than a painful situation. His nose, having undergone this treatment for some time, what seemed to be grains of millet began to appear, at which sight his disciple stopped trampling and said in soliloquy, I was told to pull them out with tweezers. The nose looked like a plucked and roasted chicken, with cheeks puffed out, though disgruntled, 
the priest suffered his disciple to deal with his nose as the man saw fit. Although, however, aware of his disciple's kindness, he might have been, he did not relish his nose being treated as if it were a piece of inert matter. Like a patient undergoing an operation at the hands of a surgeon in whom he does not place implicit trust, Zenchi reluctantly watched his disciple extract from the pores of his nose feathers of fat curled in half an inch in di diameter. The treatment finished, the disciple looked relieved and said, Now, your reverence, we have only to boil it once more, and it'll be all right. Zenchi, with a knit brow, submitted to the treatment meted out to him. When his nose was taken out of the pot for the second time, it was found, to their great surprise, remarkably shorter than before, and was not very different from a normal hooked nose. Stroking his greatly shortened nose, he timidly and nervously peered into the mirror which his disciple held out to him. The nose, which previously had dangled below his chin, had miraculously dwindled and not protruding below his upper lip was barely a relic of what it had once been. The red blotches, which bespeckled it, were probably only bruises caused by the trampling. No one will laugh at me any more, the priest thought to himself. He saw in the mirror that the face reflected there was looking into the face outside the mirror, blinking its eyes in satisfaction. But all day long he was uneasy and feared that his nose might grow long, so whenever he had the chance, whether in chanting sutras or in eating meals, he stealthily touched his nose. However, he found his nose installed in good shape above his lip, without straying beyond its lower lip. Early in the morning, at the moment of waking, he stroked the tip of his nose and found that it was still as short as ever. After a gap of many years, he, at that moment, recognized the same relief he had felt when he had completed the austerities required for his transcription of the lengthy Lotus Sutra of his sect. Within the course of several days, however, Zenchi had a most surprising experience. A samurai, who was on business, visited the temple of Ikinawa, looked amused as ever before, and quite incapable of uttering a word, he could but stare fixedly at the priest's nose. This was not all. The page, who had once dropped Zenchi's nose into the bowl of gruel, happened to pass by Zenchi in the lecture hall. At first, resisting his impulse to laugh, casting down his eyes, he could not, for long, withhold his burst of laughter. The sextons under Zenchi's supervision would listen respectfully while seated face to face with their master, but on more than one occasion they fell to chuckling as soon as he turned his back. Zenchi at first attributed the laughter of his page and the sextons to the marked change in his feature, but by and by, with his head cocked on one side, interrupting the sutra he was chanting, he would mutter to himself, the change alone does not give a plausible explanation for their laughter. Zenchi Nago, their laughter is now different from what it was when your nose was long. If you could say that the unfamiliar nose looks more ridiculous than the familiar one, that would be once and for all settle the matter. But there must be some other reason behind it. They didn't laugh heartily or irresistibly before. The poor, amiable priest on such occasions would look up a fusion goddess of wisdom, pictured on the scroll hanging close behind him, and calling to mind the long nose he had wielded until four or five days previously. He would lapse into melancholy, like one sunken low, recalleth his glory of bygone days. But it was to be regretted that he was deficient in judgment sufficient to find a solution to this quandary. Man is possessed of two contradictory sentiments. Everyone will sympathize with another's misfortune, but when the other manages to pull through his misfortune, he not only thinks it's safe to laugh at him to his face, but also comes even to regard him with envy. In extreme cases, some may feel like casting him into his former misfortune again, and may even harbor some enmity, if negative, towards him. Zenchi was at a loss to know what precisely made him forlorn, but his unhappiness was caused by nothing more than the wayward caprices of those surrounding him. The priests and the layman, 
Ebikino. Day after day, Zanchi, becoming more and more unhappy and vexed, would not open his mouth without speaking sharply to someone and was ever out of sorts, until even the disciple who administered to him the effective remedy began to backbite him, saying, the master will be punished for his sins. What especially enraged Zenchi was the mischief played on him by the page. One day, hearing a dog yelping wildly, he casually looked outside and found the page with a stick about two feet long in his hand, chasing a lean and shaggy dog and shouting, Watch out there for your nose! Watch out or I'll hit your nose! Snatching the wooden stick from the page's hand, the priest struck him sharply across the face. It was the very stick which had been used to hold up Zenchi's nose. Finally, Zenchi came to feel sorry and even resentful for having had his long nose shortened. One night, after sunset, it happened that the wind seemed to have arisen suddenly. The noisy tinkling of the pagoda wind bells came to his cell. The cold, moreover, had noticeably increased in severity that Zenchi could not go to sleep, try as he might, and turning in his bed, he became aware of an itching in his nose. Putting his hand to his nose, he felt that it had become swollen, as if with dropsy. It seemed feverish, too. It was so drastically shortened that I might have caught some disease, he muttered to himself, caressing his nose as reverently as he would if it were holding the offerings of incense and flowers to be dedicated at the altar. The following morning, Zenchi, as usual, awoke early, and he noticed that the garden was as bright as if it were carpeted with gold, because in the garden the ginkgo trees and the horse chestnuts had overnight shed all their leaves, and the crest of the pagoda must have been encrusted with frost, for the nine copper rings of the spire were brightly shining in the still faint glimmer of the rising sun. Sitting on the veranda, the shutters already opened, he drew a deep breath, and at that same moment a certain feeling the nature of which he had all but forgotten came back to him. Instinctively, he put his hand to his nose, and what he touched was not the short nose that he had been that had been his the night before, but the former long nose that had dangled five or six inches over his lips. In one night, he found his nose had grown as long as it had been previously, and for this, for some reason, made him feel refreshed and as happy as he had felt in the first moments when his nose had been shortened. Nobody will laugh at me any more, he whispered to himself. His long nose dangled in the autumn breeze of early morning.